Go ahead and get started. We have a lot to cover today. <clears throat> so first, a couple of logistics items. Um, I posted in the announcement section some information about your group project, group project valuation requirements uh, this morning. So <clears throat> if we come towards the end of our semester, uh, basically what's going to happen is the first part of your group project, which is the PowerPoint presentation, is going to happen three weeks from today. Okay, So on Monday, November 23rd, you will have to turn in a PowerPoint file, which covers the four sections of your group project. And on that day, somebody from your team will have to make a 10-minute presentation of that PowerPoint for a grade to me. Okay? So that is the first part of the group project. Right. Now, in previous semesters, I used to make the entire team present. Because it's 10 minutes, um, you probably won't be able to have six or seven people present. So you can have one to probably no more than three people. Leave it up to you. But again, you have to cover the whole project in that PowerPoint file. One week later, <clears throat> on Monday, November 30th, which is the Monday after Thanksgiving, uh, the paper is due. Okay. Now, basically, it's the exact same information. One is a PowerPoint, the other is the paper, right? And the way it's going to work is the PowerPoint is going to be worth 7.5% of your semester grade. The paper is worth 15% of your semester grade. So based on what you present and turn in that day, it's the same information. It will be graded independently of each other. Okay, so you have to cover the exact same information just in two forms, right? Now, the good news for you <clears throat> is that the reason I'm putting the PowerPoint a week in advance is because at the end of that day, and, and it will have to be efficient, because everybody has to present that day. So we'll just start, you'll have 10 minutes, we'll move on to the next team. I'll give you a grade, and I'll give you feedback. So you can take that, and then you can improve your paper, right? because it's the same information. Now, out of fairness to the other teams, there's a significant disadvantage to going first right, in the PowerPoint presentations. And the reason why is because whatever mistakes you make, or whatever things you do well, the remaining teams in the room will see that. And then they will be able to either improve upon their presentation and or try and fix what they forgot to do. So here's how I'm going to try and equalize this. Um, you can't present for grade any data that's not in the PowerPoint. So you're not going to turn in any Excel. You're not going to turn in any screenshots from Bloomberg unless they're embedded in the PowerPoint. So you have to embed everything in the PowerPoint. So if in the middle of your presentation, you jump away from the PowerPoint to something else, I'm going to stop listening to you, okay? Because I just, out of fairness to the other groups, you can only talk about the data that's actually in your PowerPoint presentation. And again, that's just a fairness for all of the groups. So again, Monday, <coughs> November 23rd, 10 a.m., everybody will turn in their PowerPoint. That day, everybody will give their PowerPoint presentation for a grade. You'll then get feedback. <coughs> And then based on that feedback, uh, you'll have a week to do the paper. And I'll talk about the paper in a second. And then what will happen is sometime in early December, you'll make another PowerPoint presentation, polished one with all of the changes uh, and updates uh, back for the final 7.5% of the grade. Okay? So that's the way that it's going to work. Okay? So PowerPoint, full paper grade, second PowerPoint presentation. Right? And the reason for the second PowerPoint presentation is that some of you will be presenting to a corporate sponsor, and so I want to make sure that whatever gets presented to the corporate sponsor is good. Right? So that's why we're going to grade it before and improve upon it before we turn you loose in front of somebody outside of Maryland. So that is the goal of the way that this project is going to work. All right, so let's talk about the paper. The paper <clears throat> is going to be four sections, same four sections of the PowerPoint. And again, PowerPoint, you got 10 minutes. So two and a half minutes per section, you got to cover all section. It's going to have to be very efficient. Okay, the paper is going to be approximately 12 pages. Think about it, about three or so pages per section. Four sections, 12 pages. Now that's not a minimum. It could be longer than that, but just based on what people have done before, it's usually 12 to 15 pages. 10 to 12 point font, double spaced. Okay, we got to actually be able to read what you turn in, plus exhibits. Okay, so the 12 pages is what's written. On top of that, you're going to have to put in exhibits from Bloomberg, exhibits from IBIS World, exhibits from the Excel models, etc. 
and you're going to have to turn in your Excel models. Right? So when you do the PowerPoint presentation, you won't have to turn in your Excel model. When you turn in the paper, you have to turn in three Excel files. You got to turn in your as is, you got to turn in your bowl, you got to turn in your bear, and you got to do your write up, okay, with the all the paper stuff associated with that. So that's the one that's going to require all the files to be turned in. So again, when you do the PowerPoint on Monday, November 23rd, you don't have to give me your Excel valuation model. All right? Now you'll again, you need to embed for the valuation section some data, okay? But you're not going to give me the actual Excel file until the following week. Okay? Questions about any of that? Logistically, pretty straightforward. All right, <clears throat> so what are the four parts of the group project? Uh, we've already completed those, but here's a reminder. So section one, EIC. Okay, so economy, we talked about the impact of beta, beta sensitivity. We talked about understanding the industry, whether or not it's an attractive industry, the RV section of Bloomberg, and whether or not that attractiveness is going to change over the next five years, five forces analysis and write-up, plus additional data sourcing from Bloomberg Intelligence and or IBIS World. You also must talk about competitive advantage. Does the company have financial advantage, as we defined earlier, and what could cause that to change over time? That's the EIC section with supporting data. Everything you do needs supporting data. Okay, so you can't plagiarize, you can footnote. Okay, you can put references to, but that's the point. You need to create references to materials and you need to aggregate and edit to each of the sections. Second, historical analysis. You will have to do the ROIC tree analysis and the CFI analysis. So if you look at the McDonald's assignment that was due today, so I'll pull up the as-is valuation we're about to go through. And if I go to the tab called uh, where is it? ROIC drivers, this is the ROIC tree. Okay, so it's automatically created for you in the model. You will need to go through and explain the historical five-year analysis of the ROIC tree. Then you'll go to the CFI tab. And again, you have the five historical years of CFI. You will need to explain the five-year historical CFI. That is the historical financial analysis. That's section two. Section three is the multiples analysis. Okay, so we will do in class today the McDonald's multiple analysis. You'll pretty much have to do a similar analysis for your group project. The difference is today you only did one company. For the group project, you're going to need to do a minimum of six. Okay, so you're going to have to talk about six companies. You're going to talk about why they're trading at premiums or discounts. And you got to talk about what it says about their expected ROICs and growth rates. So that's the multiple analysis section that you're going to have to do for the group project. And then finally, the valuation. So in the valuation, you're going to have to do the as-is model. You're going to have to do the bull and the bear model. So you have three Excel files. You'll then create a target price with a recommendation. You'll then write it up explaining all of your analysis and assumptions. And finally, you'll have two sanity checks, which again, we'll talk about today as we finish up McDonald's. Sanity check number one is called the ROIC chart. Sanity check number two is called the implied multiples. Okay, And then you'll have to use those to defend your valuation. So basically, those are the four sections of the group project. Now again, you're going to get a group grade for the group project. However, there will be peer evaluations. So if you have not been communicating with your group and we're more than halfway through the semester, there's peer evaluations for stock track and there's peer evaluations for um, this project. So for example, if you haven't been participating with your group through the first half of the semester and your group puts in a negative peer evaluation, I'm going to take whatever grade for stock track and switch it to a zero. Okay? And I'm going to do the same thing for the group project. So if you're not participating with your group, there's no chance that you can pass this class. You will fail the class, all right? Because there's just too many group project points. So we're three weeks away. It's very important that you are fully participating in your group and that your group does not write negative peer reviews that said this person never responded to emails, they never showed up at meetings, and they showed up the Friday night before it was due and they wanted full credit for the work. That will be very bad for you. I hope that that's not the case. Unfortunately, I did hear from a group in a previous class that that is the case, which is why I'm stating it. And I'm just letting everybody know that it is a group project for a reason, and there will be peer evaluations as part of the group grade. All right, <clears throat> so that's the group project. That's our timeline for the next several weeks. All right, questions about any of that? 
pretty straightforward. All right, so back to this. Um, next piece is the next leading up to this. So Wednesday, there will be no class. So Wednesday is the fourth. In lieu of a class, there will be a Bloomberg lab assignment. So you will be completing the Bloomberg lab assignments in lieu of class, and it will be due on Monday, and that will be your next graded assignment for the homework that is due next Monday. As I mentioned to you, I'm about to have surgery on my foot. That's why I did the bat next week, so next week I'm not around. Wish I'd rather be here, to be honest with you. But in any event, um, <clears throat> so the, the bat is your only opportunity for extra credit this semester. I will not be giving any other opportunities for extra credit. In the past, I've given other opportunities for extra credit. I've decided this semester, that's it. Okay, So you don't take the bat, you don't get extra credit. So the way it's going to work is there's four opportunities to take the bat. You can see them listed in a previous announcement. If you want to take the bat and you want to get extra credit, you need to sign up and register because that registration tells us that you were here in class taking the bat. So between getting a score and signing up for the registration, that's very important. The other part of the bat that's going to be very important <clears throat> is that um, you sign up before the start of class. Bloom Bloomberg is administering the bat. I obviously won't be here, but they have invited anybody at the University of Maryland College Park campus to show up during those four time slots. So if people show up and register, there's only 40 slots available for each one of the bat takings. So if other people register and you get locked out, you lose your opportunity for extra credit. So it is in your interest to make sure that you register for the section of the bat that you want to take to make sure that you don't get locked out of taking the bat because there's just a physical limitation to how many people will fit in this room. Okay. So again, there's not enough, there's not a problem if only the 443 students take it, but Bloomberg is advertising this beyond 443 and the other finance faculty are advertising in their classes. So they're telling them to come to our sections to take the bat. So your second alternative is to take it online. Talked about the code, you can take it online for free, but here's the key, you have to finish it by Wednesday. Same time as the physical bat, okay? So if you don't finish it by the time that the physical bat that's being offered is done, not gonna consider that extra credit. So you have to take it by that week with everybody else. Now you can't take it later. Those are, the again, the only opportunities for extra credit that you are going to have available to you this semester. All right. <clears throat> so the other thing, so I want to talk about our McDonald's assignment for today. We have a lot to cover with McDonald's. But I did hear from several people that they were having some trouble exporting data from Bloomberg as part of the, the McDonald's assignment. And the symptom was this. I had no trouble exporting in the past, but suddenly I couldn't export anymore. So Bloomberg was actually a guest lecturer today in the 11 a.m. section, and I asked them, and they reminded me that every terminal at the school has an export limit. It's a monthly export limit. And when we trigger the monthly export limit, they shut down all of the ability to export to Excel for the next 30 days. It's a rolling 30 days. But basically, that's what's happened, is you guys are sitting on terminals that have export limits. And the export limits are not by account, it's by terminal, okay? So if somebody else was pushing out a lot of data to Excel, it doesn't matter, they were the ones that could have shut down the terminal, not you. And Bloomberg does it weird, meaning the export limit is not based on volume of data, it's based on pricing of data, okay? So what it means is they have this arbitrary pricing amount that you can export in a given month. And what they do is they charge different amounts for different data exports. So it could be a small amount of data that's exported, but it could be considered by Bloomberg to be very valuable, and that could trigger being shut down that terminal for the whole month. And just remember that these labs, it's not just you guys using them. You got all the PhD students, you got faculty doing research, and they're the ones that are more likely to cause these terminals to be shut down. Because Bloomberg doesn't really care that much about the FA data because you can get income statement and balance sheet data right off the SEC website. It's the more valuable data in Bloomberg. Like if you're trying to get historical interest rates in Eastern Europe, you know, or if you're trying to get, you know, bond pricing data in the fixed income market, you know, across big series of times, that's what they'll start considering more valuable data and that's what they will start charging more on. So regardless, that's what happened to you. So if you have that problem, go to another terminal. 
Uh, Bloomberg did say that you can click on the help screen and you can ask them if that terminal had hit its limit for the month and when it will be reset. So you can go through help and ask them, but that's a symptom that unfortunately some of you guys have, have actually run into. So just yet another challenge for your assignment, which also leads to, I wouldn't be doing these at the last minute. Okay, because if, if you do have that problem, make sure you have the alternative to, to find another terminal. And I try and find something that's a little bit more out of the way in the room. All right, because basically if you walk into the lab, the first terminals everybody kind of sits down at, probably the ones that are going to be hitting the limits first. All right, questions about any of that? We're pretty straightforward. Yeah. So to take the bat, if you go here to the announcements, and if I click on, where was it? The bat announcement. In the bat announcement, there was a link in here to register for the bat, the RSVP register link. No, you just specify which one of the sections you want to sign up for. If you want to take it outside the classroom, you don't need to register. So the, the sole purpose of registration is just to make sure that they want to control how many people are in the room, so they don't want to have too many people in this room. So how do you get the code to do that? It's right here. Oh. So they also said in the announcement, oh. if you want to take it at home, uh, then you use this code, UMD Fall 15, and then that will give you the free version of the bat to take it home. So those are your two options. Yeah. How many points is it? Uh, five. So you want to get five or does it it's all or nothing. You get if you take it, you get five. No matter how horrible your score, I'll still give you five points. All right. But to be honest with you, it's it's in your interest not to get a completely horrible score. Like that would just be bad. Make us look bad. And the reason why is because you will not have your individual statistics published. However. The University of Maryland does. <laughs> and so if we have 130 people, let's say take the bat out of 160, and the average score is really low because 30 people came in for five minutes and left, then basically it's going to make the University of Maryland look like a bunch of idiots. right? And they're going to say, because they're going to say the score for the school is just terrible. So they won't see your individual scores, but they will see the school score. Right, and your taking it will affect the school sport. So I would ask you to, to please take it seriously because that's the one danger forcing people to take it is that everybody that takes it is in the score. Now, when we did this last fall, a year ago, and everybody took it, Maryland actually did extremely well. Like the University of Maryland was like much higher than school averages, including a lot of the Ivies. All right, so that was actually very positive, and that will help us with like employers and other things. If we come in as, and we look like, you know, the below average companies, then that will, will hurt us. So that's the only other thing that I would say about the bat. All right, so let's talk about McDonald's. <clears throat> so we had an assignment for McDonald's today. And again, we'll be doing more practice coming up with your next homework assignment uh, on Wednesday, the Bloomberg Lab. But let's go back and talk about the first two pieces. So you should have gone in for McDonald's. you have done MCD US Equity. You would have gone first to do the multiples. You would have gone to the RV screen. And in the RV screen, <coughs> you would have clicked on custom. You would have gone to the multiples tab. And then you would have outputted this to Excel. And I had said you can use the Bloomberg peers uh, as the default one. So you probably would have come up with something like this. And then your numbers may vary slightly. Uh, just depending on the time that you did it, because obviously during different days, these multiples are going to be adjusted in real time. All right. So when you adjust this export to Excel, then you will have a file that looks like this. Okay. <clears throat> or looks almost like this. So the one thing that I did to this file in the last class is column C um, was basically the market cap column, right? Because it exports market cap. So what I did is I replaced the market cap with the estimated margin. And we had defined in our last class that the estimated margin equals, you can see this here, the EV to sales divided by the EV to EBIT to get us a sense of the estimated margin. Then I just copied and pasted that down. Right. This file and all the other files that we're talking about today would be on the file section for McDonald's, MCD, uh, on Elms. So I put all this data here. 
Okay, so <clears throat> this would have been the file that you would have exported depending on time of day. It could have been slightly different. Right. So the, the real key to the homework was to start out and saying for McDonald's, are they trading at a premium or discount? And more importantly, based on this data, do we think the McDonald's has a higher or lower expected ROIC relative to its growth rate than what it's telling us than the rest of its peers? More specifically, a higher expected spread. So anybody want to try and answer that one? Come up with an answer that you're comfortable with? McDonald's spread higher or lower and why? And what multiples would have showed you that? Mm -hmm. shows, we know from like the assignment that the company experienced negative growth in recent years. However, the fact that it's still trading the premium it, um, shows that it has a bad, most likely has better ROIC than here. So when you say it's trading at premium, which ratios relative to the market are you looking at that's trading at premium? It's the EV uh, over next year. Uh, estimated sales. Also the best pack. Okay, so <clears throat> let's dig a little deeper here. So first of all, this is an example of where I think the price to book multiple is distorted, right? Because companies like Sonic at 85 and Jack in the Box at 28 times book value just seems like there's some weird stuff going on here with the equity of these firms relative to their market cap. So unfortunately, I don't think we can use price to book to help us with the spread for this assignment. And that's why we look at multiple multiples, right? Because if we had just said export price to book and rank them, first of all, what's the value in that, all right? But second of all, it wouldn't mislead us because it wouldn't really give us the answer. So when we do multiple analysis, the reason why I'm pushing you to look at six multiples is because it gives you a bigger picture than what one multiple says. And what we're looking for is consistency. Do they all tell us the same thing to make sure we're drawing appropriate conclusions? So let's go back to PEG. McDonald's does have a little bit higher PEG, right? Now, <clears throat> here's the thing. Then let's go to EV to EBITDA and EV to EBIT, right? Just so happens that McDonald's EV to EBITDA is very close to the EV to EBITDA of the market average. All right, 12.95 versus 13.05. So tiny bit of a discount, but very close to the average. There's a percentage, it's very close as a percentage. Same thing with EV to EBIT, same thing with the price to earnings ratio, okay? So tiny bit of a discount, but very close. Now here's the thing, the market's expected growth rate is almost 10%, McDonald's expected growth rate is a little less than 8%. Well, that's a pretty substantial difference. So McDonald's growth rate is much lower. It's about 20% lower than the markets. Yet, they come up with similar multiples, right? Well, the only way you make that up is, first of all, is the tax rate doing anything to affect this? McDonald's is actually paying slightly higher taxes or about similar tax rates. So it's probably not the tax rate that's causing this. And in this case, it would have probably caused a lower tax rate in order to get the same multiple. So it goes back to reinforcing that McDonald's probably has a higher spread than the rest of the marketplace, right? And I'm getting multiple ways to support that conclusion based on the trading data, right? So it's not just print out the pegs and do a sort from lowest to highest, okay? That's no credit. There's, there's no value in that analysis, right? The real analysis, though, is when I combine the peg, which is higher than the market, with the fact that their growth rate is lower by 20%, and you get to the same multiples, EV to EBIT, EV to EBITDA, and to some degree PE, for same tax rate, the only thing that would explain that would be a higher expected spread. So McDonald's has a higher expected spread than the average company in this list. Questions about that? That's what you really needed to say for your homework assignment. That's what you're going to have to do for your group project. Except, here's the difference of the group project. For the homework, you only had to do it for one company. For the group project, you've got to do it for at least six. So let's now go to a second company on this list. Yes? What does Well, what I was saying about growth is that this LTG, which we're using as a directional proxy for the G in our model, is 20% lower than that LTG. 
So what I'm saying is, to get to the same multiple, if it's a function of growth and spread, to get to the same multiple, McDonald's has to have a higher expected ROIC. Right? Matter of fact, to go another way, which is McDonald's EV to sales is higher than their peers. When we did the estimated margin, it's higher than the peers, which further reinforces if you have a high margin, you're more likely, not, not a guarantee, but more likely to probably have a higher ROIC. So that probably is further supporting evidence that McDonald's has a higher expected spread. That's what we're trying to get out of this analysis. Right? And what's also important about all of this is we need to do this, and that's why I put it this way, before we do our valuations. Because this is already framing some of the assumptions that we're going to make when we actually do our as-is, our bull, and our bear. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let's talk about another company. All right? Let's talk about Sonic. Okay? Sonic is the next company down. What can we say about Sonic relative to the industry average? We just went through McDonald's. What can we now say about Sonic? Looking at this screen. It's easier to see. Sonic have a higher or lower expected spread? Yeah. Say Sonic has, excuse me, Sonic has a lower expected spread um, because they have mo um, pretty much the exact opposite of McDonald's. You look at the same uh, ratios, EV to next year sales way below average, EV, EV to EBITDA well below average. Um, and even though they're paying a slightly lower, or a significantly lower tax rate, um, they're also, their peg is much uh, much more below average, and their margin is um, two-thirds of what McDonald's is. And even that high growth rate of 16% is not enough to make up for it. But that's the point. It's that high growth rate is not valuable because of that low spread for all the reasons that you just said. And that's what's what we know about Sonic, is that Sonic is growing 50% faster than the industry average, a little bit more than 50% faster than the industry average, yet trades at a much lower multiple. All right, so that's the point. And they're already paying less taxes, which should make them more valuable. So obviously Sonic has a low spread, which is supported, as he said, by the low margins. So that was an excellent analysis, and that was dead on what he just did for Sonic. Does everybody understand what he just said? Questions about that? Okay. How about, here's where it also gets troubling, is then you run into a company like Popeyes, and sometimes... Bloomberg is either missing a data point, it considers it an outlier, so it gives you an NA for not available, or it doesn't have a data point. So basically, they don't have an EV to next year's EBIT, right? So therefore, we can't really get an estimated margin. But that being said, let's say we wanted to talk about Popeyes. What can we say about Popeyes? We just talked about Sonic, and we just talked about McDonald's. What can we say about Popeyes? <coughs> Less than who? The average. Is it higher or lower than Sonic's? Higher than Sonic's, but still lower than average. So the expected spread for for um, Popeyes is below average, but it's still better than Sonic's. All right. How do we know it's better than Sonic's? Okay, but that's the point. They have the same growth rates of about 16% a year. They're actually paying higher taxes at Popeyes, and they actually have higher EV to EBIT, DA, in this case, multiples, and higher PE ratios, which suggests a better spread. However, probably less than McDonald's because their peg is a lot lower, and here's the thing. I don't know how much less because they're, even though we don't have an estimated margin, Popeyes probably has a reasonable margin. How can I say that Popeyes has a reasonable margin? What could, what could help me draw that conclusion? I know the estimated margin says pound value, exclamation point, but how could I infer that that number is probably pretty high? Or at least close to industry average? 
we'll just look at the enterprise value to sales. So their enterprise value to sales is very close to the market and very close to McDonald's, which suggests that Popeyes is probably a pretty high margin firm because that's the big driver of EV to sales. So here's the point. If I had to rank Popeyes, McDonald's, Sonic, who has the highest expected ROIC to lowest? One, two, and three. Highest to lowest. Popeyes, McDonald's, Sonic. Who's number one? Or spread, I should say. McDonald's number one. Who'd be number two? Popeyes would be number two, and Sonic would be number three. Right? Questions about any of that? Right? It would be an insufficient answer to just list the three pegs in that order and say that that's your answer. Right? Because you have to triangulate, you have to give multiple sources to make sure that there's not an anomaly going on in one of these ratios. What can we say about Yum? Yum is KFC, it's uh, Pizza Hut, and it's Taco Bell. So what can we say about Yum? Higher or lower expected ROIC than the market? It's like the Jeopardy song. <clears throat> All right, well, look at their peg and look at their price to book. Price to book, less so on this one, but technically you could look at it. But look at their peg and you can see that is a starting point, yum, has relative to the industry, crazy price to book, but a below average peg. You can see that their tax rate is lower than the industry average. And you can see that their growth is a little bit higher than the industry average. And then if you look over at the multiples, EV to EBIT, EV to EBITDA, and PE are all for yum trading at a discount to industry average, which suggests if I have higher growth, and my multiples are lower multiples, and I also am paying a lower tax rate, then I probably have a lower expected spread. Right? And if I look at my estimated margin of about 16%, that further supports that it's probably even lower. Questions about that? So as I said, you're going to have to do this for your group project for six different companies. Your own plus five others, and then you got to rank all six. One to six. Expected spread. What can we get out of the multiples? And what can we get out of the analysis? <clears throat> Questions about this? Because you, your next Bloomberg Lab slash next graded homework assignment will be doing another multiples analysis. <clears throat> all right. So... Now we're going to go on to the valuation of McDonald's. But before we do, during the 11 a.m. section today, Qualcomm was our guest speaker. Uh, or sorry, somebody from Bloomberg talking about Qualcomm was our guest speaker. And Erica had created, she referred to a new part of Bloomberg against like these nuggets. You find out these screens that I didn't know existed, but I think might help us when we do EIC. Okay, so I'll just show this to you really quick. Again, I didn't know about it until this morning. So if you go to a company, and I'm at McDonald's, the code is C-O-R-R. -R. It stands for correlation. And basically, it's a correlation analysis. Right? So in this case, I'll create a new one. And I can choose whatever time frame that I want. So I'll say, I don't know, three years. So I'll go back to 2012. Bloomberg. 2012 to today. All right, and I'll, I'm okay with daily data or, I don't know, we'll do weekly data, and I want a correlation, okay? And I'll click Next. 
So here's the point. Take a security like McDonald's. I can type in McDonald's. And then what I can do is I can look at its correlation with other factors in the Bloomberg database. So what might, and think about back to EIC, obviously we're doing a beta analysis, but what are some of the things that might affect McDonald's? External things, yeah. So exchange rates, that's a really good one. So let's see, and we can start typing a search here. <coughs> exchange. All right, so I want an exchange, I can't spell today, exchange rate, and I want the, uh, is there like a, Looking for a, 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 like a re exchange rate index. Let's see, exchange rate index. Um, which one? Thank you. So USD, what exchange rate? USD exchange rate, can't type, R-A-T-E, and nothing is coming up. You also need USD, not USC. Oh, that's probably why. USD, USD, USD currency. Uh, all right, just because I'm going to get lazy, I'm having trouble with typing today. Let's compare the USD to the euro. Okay. So, and just for the heck of it, let's do another one. What else might affect McDonald's besides its exchange rates? Maybe uh, labor prices, labor costs. So let's look at labor costs. Labor costs. And in this case, I'll look at the U.S. unit labor costs for non-farm business sector quarter over quarter changes. Add your own list, and then you'll basically click on next. You'll save your screen. 443, 401 test. Finish it, and then boom, there it is. So for some reason, it didn't like the labor cost one, but here's the point. McDonald's is negatively correlated to the euro US dollar exchange rate. Okay, so basically, <clears throat> and that would probably make sense, right? So Essentially, they have a big exposure to Europe, and oh, by the way, I could come on here, I can edit this list, and I can say, what about, I don't know, yum? And I'll add yum to this list. So I could then see if I quickly save this, update this. No, I guess I gotta save it first. Edit, yum. Oh, I'm looking for a save button. There we go. All right. Update. There we go. Where, interestingly, Yum is positively correlated. McDonald's is negatively correlated. All right. So back to this, I can start looking at correlation. So just as an example, last fall, uh, somebody used a different screen to do the same thing. But basically what they were doing is their company was Alcoa, and they looked at the price of aluminum. And they basically showed that Alcoa stock price pretty much tracks almost one-to-one -one the price of aluminum over time. right? And, and so that would be the point, that if you're really understanding Alcoa, you got to understand what's happening to aluminum pricing. So back to this, whether it's exchange rates, whether it's the input costs, I think Bloomberg's got like a healthy eating index. <clears throat> you can pretty much run a lot of different correlations. But when you start thinking about your EIC, there's some additional supporting data for your companies for your EIC analysis to talk about how changes in the economy or economic data will affect. So obviously everybody has to do a beta, but here's your chance to do some additional data as part of your group project. So that is the core, C-O-R-R, -R, function correlation within Bloomberg. Questions about that? All right, so... Let's do our as-is for McDonald's. Now, 
I had saved to Canvas a file, which I'll just download here, called the baseline. And baseline is just a term I made up. <laughs> and the whole goal of the baseline is just to say, if I took the previous model that we had used and I just updated it with the McDonald's data, then I'd be ready to start my as-is valuation. Okay, so I went into the model data and I had exported from Bloomberg and updated McDonald's. Then I went into assumptions, last reported year 2014, put in McDonald's WAC, changed the CVG back to 3% because we had changed it differently in a different model, put in the new shares outstanding for McDonald's versus the previous company, put in the estimated sales and EBITDA and the ratio screen equals previous year and copied it forward mainly because I don't want to have, let's say we're doing Apple last week, I don't want to have Apple's data mixed in with McDonald's data, which could really throw off my valuation if one of those hard-coded changed assumptions go in there. So I updated the uh, growth rate, I updated the EBITDA margin, and I also updated the tax rate because when we originally did the tax rate, we said that the first year on the original company was an anomaly so we left it out. McDonald's 2009 doesn't look like an anomaly, so I actually reset it to the six-year tax rate as opposed to the five-year tax rate. So the average of the six years. All right? doesn't change it substantially, but regardless. And then that was the tax rate I used going forward, the 31.7. Okay? And this is what I call the baseline. And from the baseline, I need to get to my as-is. But here's the point. I already know some things about McDonald's. Right? I know that the way, by doing my multiples analysis, that the way McDonald's is being priced in the market today, back to the RV section, the way that McDonald's is actually being priced in the market today is the market thinks that McDonald's actually has a good spread, which they're going to continue over time. In fact, Mar McDonald's is expected to have a pretty good margin over time. So if I really look at McDonald's challenges with why, given a good spread and a good margin, their multiples aren't higher, it's the lack of growth. And that's the point. McDonald's is the slowest growing amongst all their peers, right? So even before I do my valuation, this will help infer some of the things when I start thinking about my as is and the cases that I create, some of the assumptions that should be on my mind. Now, in addition, I should be going to data sources like IBISWorld. So off of the portal, VBIC homepage, go to IBIS World, find the McDonald's industry report, in this case this is U.S. fast food, and look at something like, for example, revenue growth rates. So I can see that the annual growth rate for fast food in the U.S. is low single digits, approximately 2% plus or minus a little bit over the next several years. So I already have a sense of industry growth rate. I should have done... Again, the BI section of Bloomberg. I should be looking at what the industry data says there to help infer before I do my as-is. But then again, I need to, in the interest of time, jump in here to the as-is. So I also have the idea of an estimated margin, 31.4%. So if I go back to this baseline model, then in this baseline model, that's what the estimated margin eventually goes to, the 31.4, which is actually very similar to McDonald's margin right now, 31.7. Okay, So basically, what the market is trading McDonald's on is two things. Basically, what they're saying is that their current margin is probably going to stay about the same going forward, and it's going to stay much higher than a lot of their peers. Right. So again, it reinforces the real challenge with McDonald's and the valuation for McDonald's today is really growth. Growth is the challenge for McDonald's. So, <clears throat> here's the point. I'm at $110. I need to get to about $112 of stock price. I'm already relatively close. So, what do I change? I'm probably not going to change the margin too much. I might change my EBITDA to 37.4 to match the 31.4 that's in... the RV section here, okay? It doesn't have to be exactly that amount year by year, because remember, this is kind of like a long-term average, but the idea is it's probably in that 31.4 range. 
which suggests an EBITDA margin. Sorry. Too many files open in Excel, which doesn't exactly match the EBITDA margin, but somewhere in the 37.4 range. And so again, I need to get this to 112, so a little bit higher sales. Now, if I look at the analyst estimates for the next few years for McDonald's, and I look at the growth rates, I can see McDonald's really isn't expected to grow the next few years. Mark is actually expecting about another 3% decline in the next few years. Right? And by the way, I'm still very close to the, the actual stock price. But here's what's interesting. They're not growing, but then if I go here to the assumptions tab, my CVG is 3% long term. So they're not growing for the next five years, but they're going to grow at 3% into perpetuity. That one I have a little bit more trouble with, although that is the growth rate of the industry long term. So one could argue that the current share price of McDonald's is based on that they're going to probably slowly and painfully adapt towards the trends that their peers are doing better on, and they're going to turn this thing around long term, and that the short term is worse than the long term. Because here's the problem. If McDonald's keeps deteriorating over the long term and they only get to like 1% long term growth and they just stay flat, then I'm looking at a share price of $78. So basically, there's a little bit of an inconsistency here, right? Because <clears throat> we know that McDonald's is growth challenged, but if they stay growth challenged, you can't justify the current share price. So their growth challenge for a period, and then the market must believe that they're going to overcome that growth challenge eventually. Otherwise, you don't get to that share price. This is going to be very important to my bull case, my bear case, and my feelings on McDonald's when I do my target share price. right? Because for McDonald's, I have to decide whether or not I agree that McDonald's is going to return to long-term low single-digit growth. Right? Because if it is, and they maintain their margins, they're probably a hold. <laughs> if I think that they're going to continue to be challenged with their sales growth for the next few years, and they really struggle, then they're a sell. Okay? And this is how I can infer the difference between the two. That's my bear case versus my bull case. And that's the rationale, which is much more important than just plugging in numbers. Okay. So I'll paraphrase an email that I got from a student who I won't single out, but basically said, I don't know how to do a bull and bear case. Should I just randomly plug in numbers until I get an answer? Okay. And I'm just saying that if one student asks that question, there's probably more than one <coughs> that really doesn't understand what we're doing here. And so for those of you that don't understand, because you're going to have a lot of group assignments, it's not just important to randomly put in numbers. What you have to do is you have to make sort of informed guesses, for lack of a better word, that is based on multiple data sources. So, for example, I have an informed guess of McDonald's margin going forward by looking at the trading data for McDonald's. I have an informed guess about the growth of McDonald's over the next five or six years by looking at the IBIS World Report and looking at the growth rate for the industry that it's in. Okay, So that is what's going to lead me to actually changing a ratio as opposed to just randomly putting in numbers until I get a stock price higher or lower and then saying it's 15% higher so I'm done because that's not a really good answer. So again, this is the art of finance, not the science of finance. And this is what separates the wheat from the chaff. If you really want to be valuable in your career, you get good at the art of the finance because there's a lot of people who can plug and chuck, right? And probably many of them better than you can. And that's not what the eventually is valuable. What's valuable is not the assumption you made, it's how'd you come up with it and how reasonable is it, okay? That's what's gold. All right, back to this. So here's my point about McDonald's. <clears throat> If I come back in my as-is model, so I'm going to save this for the video. I'm going to call this my McDonald's as-is.
then I need to get closer to 112. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to the assumptions. I'm going to put that back to 2%. So sorry, it's got to go back to 3%. 3%, and then I go back to the ratios, and then I say, I don't know, is that maybe negative 2% growth? Nope. Uh, negative 1% growth. Not much is really changing. So zero. And then they start growing again. Why is my stock price not changing? It's really weird. File open as is. Back to my ratios. 122. Excel continues to have problems. Uh, so I don't want to be at 122. So back to negative 2. And carry that out. Negative 2%. Uh, and then maybe negative 1%. Uh, and then, I don't know, maybe I'll change my assumption here to 2.8. So that says 3. Percent, uh, an extra decimal place. Now I'm at uh, 2.9. So the point is, I do my as is, I do my bold, my bear, and I then come up with my justification. So I'll go ahead and save this. So in the interest of time, because we got to get to our sanity checks in here in just a second, um, I know you guys did this homework assignment. So what were your final conclusions? Anybody think that McDonald's was a buy? Any buys out there? Any sells? Anybody put McDonald's in the sell category? Any holds? Okay, so we got a few people holds. All right, so what would be your hold? Um, I said it should be a hold because when I did my as-is model, I actually got it to be within a penny of what it closed out on Friday, um, 112.24. Yep. Um, so it's not undervalued, so there's no reason to buy it right now. Um, but I definitely, and I also wouldn't be uh, buying in because it's trading at a historic high. So you don't want to buy when it's at a historic high. But um, existing shareholders should sit tight because it's currently valued appropriately and let the turnaround plan um, keep going and see where it goes. Okay. Somebody else had a hold. I saw a hand up over there. Who else had a hold? Somebody in the back. <clears throat> so I think everybody gets shy. You got a hold? Yeah. So what was your hold rationale? It's actually very similar to it. It's very close to the high. And when I just put in the model, very similar to what you did with the 1270 or something like that, very close. So I just said that you know, it's not really good time to get into the press. Like, uh, so, uh, but here's the caveat to what both of you are saying. It's not a good time to get in if you see that they have tepid growth. Right? So if you look at McDonald's, and this is what's kind of important, if you go to the FA section, uh, sorry, the EEO section, and not every part of the EEO has this, but McDonald's does for retail. Click on the third tab for retail, and you can see, for example, same store sales. And for McDonald's, same store sales have been declining until they just reported earnings when same store sales spiked up. And you could directly correlate this to the stock price, which, if you look at the last 30 days, Tell me when you think they released their earnings. And their price basically went from 100 to 112. Okay, And that was all based on that really same store sales surprise where McDonald's is now getting a big surprise, which is changing the point of view on growth to be a little bit more optimistic. So this is what gets interesting, is that what you're supporting here, right, and what justifies the 112 price, whether you realize it or not, is what you're saying is, they're going to have tepid to negative growth in the next few years. But eventually, they're going to return to industry average growth. Right? And that's the, we have one data point that says that they have pulled it out. Right? But that's what we're inferring here. Otherwise, there's a disconnect in our model. Right? Because the only way, because like I said, if you keep low growth into perpetuity in the model, let's call it, I don't know, 1%. 
then you are at a share price that is far lower than today, and you're into the sell range. So I don't think you even realize that you're making these assumptions when you make these assumptions, but that's what you have to communicate when you write this up. And that's what you have to start to understand that you're actually putting into your model without even realizing that, right? Because you could just change the ratios page, not think about the CVG, leave it alone. And, you know, you left it alone, so you're saying good long-term growth. And I'm not saying that that's not what the market thinks, right? But that's actually very dangerous because there's a perception problem that McDonald's has in healthy food. And what the market could be arguing is they're going to solve that perception problem. Right? They're smart people. It's going to take them a little time, but they're going to solve it. And the new CEO is the guy who's going to solve it. Right? And that's the way that you justify $112 price. But I'm also telling you, and this is where the bear case comes in, is they go a couple quarters, they start seeing declining same-store sales growth, and the pop was just because of all-day breakfast. And suddenly people stop going to the all-day breakfast, and they're back on that downward trend. Then that 112 has a long way to go down. Right? Because a lot of McDonald's share price, a good 30 or 40 points, is based on that long-term growth estimate. Right? And if they don't return to positive, low-digit, long-term growth, then that's the bear case. Right? So I'm not saying we have to believe the bear case, and I, and I do hope for McDonald's sake that they do turn it around. Right? But I'm just saying that's how we come up with a bear case, and that's how we talk about what the bear case could be. In fact, the bull case is actually pretty easy, which is, Go to mid-single digits. Go to 5 or 6% growth. Right? Go to the type of growth rate that some of their peers are getting. Right? And then McDonald's is a strong buy. Right? So you could actually make a bear case. Right? And again, growth rate for them is plus or minus 2 points from where they are is the bull bear and the as is. So it's just a very tight range for growth, which, by the way, is very consistent with what we talked about in the RV section. All right. So sanity checks. How do we know that we're not just spewing nonsense and just babbling? Right? How do we know that what we're saying is actually a reasonable price for McDonald's, especially if we come up with a bear case or a bull case that <clears throat> is dramatically different, and that's what we believe the target price should be? How do we know that we're just not crazy? So these are the two sanity checks that you're going to have to do. Right? And in the interest of time, because I called it the as-is, I'll just go back to the as-is and make sure I'm at the as-is stock price. So I'm close to 112. That's where they are today. So I'll save this. So here's sanity check number one. There's a chart in the model called the ROIC chart. And it's a historical graph of ROIC. And what we're going to do is I'm going to wipe it out. I'm going to delete it. And then I'm going to add it back. And you can either add it into a new tab or you can make the whole chart a tab. But what I want to add in is in the EP... EOY tab, end of year economic profit, <clears throat> after goodwill, which the book talks about is the one we're going to use, is the calculated ROIC based on end of year capital, okay, as opposed to beginning of year capital, which we did for academic reasons. And here's the historical end of year ROIC, and here is the expected ROICs based on our model forecast which, by the way, the tree is based on end-of-year ROIC, so I'm just also trying to be consistent with our historical analysis in the tree. So back to this. So here's what I want to do. I want to take that row, row 15, and I want to create a line graph. So insert, I'm going to do as a chart sheet, or you can create it in a sheet. And here's the point. What I want to do is I want to make this a line graph. So I'll change the chart, chart type to a line. So what this does is it gives me both the historical and forecasted ROIC based on the assumptions in our model. Right? So here's the idea. I come up with a terrible bull case for McDonald's. Oh, sorry, bear case. So I come in here and I do ratios. And I say sales are going to fall 5%. <coughs> and margins are going to plummet to 20%. Okay? And I get to a $38 stock price. Right? Just all hell is going to break loose with McDonald's. So I come here to the chart, which I'll call the ROIC chart. That would be the ROIC in the future that gets me a $38 stock price, and this is what they've done historically. Now, I'm not saying they're not trending down, but 
something would really dramatically have to happen to get them to a $38 stock price. So that's what I mean by the ROIC chart is a sanity check, right? Because we might, in some form of delusion, start to believe our own ratios, right? The reality distortion field sets in, and then we start believing in this case that we create, and then sometimes we get too pe pessimistic or too optimistic. So when you do your valuation as part of your PowerPoint presentation and as part of your paper, you're going to have to give me the ROIC chart. And it's got to pass the smile test. So if myself and the TAs are looking at this and you see us smiling or laughing, then you know you've just basically killed your grade because we don't believe you. We, don't, we just don't believe your valuation. So this has to pass a reasonableness test. So you'd have to explain how McDonald's is going to see their ROIC go down by more than half in the next few years and really justify that, given that that's not their track record. All right. The flip side would be, I would expect it, and this is what the book talks about, to go towards the whack, but this is a little dramatic. Okay? Let's say it can't happen. Right? Anything could possibly happen in the future, but the likeliness of happening is down. It's low. So that is one of the sanity checks that we're going to add to our model. I'll undo this, but notice what the base case does when I'm back to the as is. And when I do, and let's say we did have a hold, and I look at my ROIC chart, notice that the ROIC in the future is pretty consistent with what it's been for the last five years. So to me, that doesn't seem unreasonable for a company like McDonald's, which has maintained a pretty good dominant position for a long period of time. Expected to do it. So I can buy this when I do my hold. Okay? Sanity check number two. <clears throat> it's going to involve the multiples. So I'm going to take the RV file that we had exported from Bloomberg and that added the estimated margin. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to name the sheet. I'm going to call it the multiples. And I'm going to right click. I'm going to move or copy. I'm going to switch to the as is valuation that we're working on. And I'm going to take it at the end. So I'm basically going to put that tab as the last one in our model. So now this multiple spreadsheet that we had exported from Bloomberg is the last tab in our model. Okay. So nothing has changed about it. It's just now part of that model rather than being a separate model, separate Excel file. So here's what you're going to have to do. And this is going to be part of your next homework assignment. So this is based on actual data from Bloomberg. Okay, This is Bloomberg's enterprise value divided by next year's sales, EBITDA, and EBIT. If you go to the DCF valuation tab, you will see that we calculate an enterprise value. So in our model, we have an enterprise value. In our model, we have a forecasted EBITDA. So in our model, we have an enterprise value to EBITDA. All right, in our model, we have an enterprise value. In our model, we have a sales forecast for two years out. We have a forecasted EV to sales for two years out. Okay, so I'm going to use the word implied comps, all right? As in, not from Bloomberg comps, but the comps created by our model. Or maybe we'll call these the model comps. Right? And so that's the point. In this tab, for multiples, I'm going to add a row, and I'm going to call it the implied comps, or the implied multiples. And basically, I'm going to take the calculated ones from the model and put it down here. Okay. Now, here's the other thing that we have to adjust. The way we calculate enterprise value is slightly different than the way Bloomberg calculates enterprise value. So, if I go to the FA section, I can see that there's a tab under key stats, subtab, called enterprise value. And this is the definition Bloomberg uses to calculate enterprise value. It's the market cap minus all of the cash plus the preferred equity, plus the minority interest, plus the debt. <coughs> What's different here than our definition of enterprise value? Because our definitions are threes and fours. So what's different?
And I'll give you a hint to remind you of some of this stuff. If you go to the TFI tab, these are threes and fours. Well, there's one thing you'll notice that Bloomberg doesn't calculate for enterprise value that's in our three and four section. They're excluding retirement related liabilities as a subtraction. So that's not part of their calculation for enterprise value. The other thing they're doing is they're taking all of this and they're subtracting all cash, where we would just focus on excess cash. So basically what I'm saying is that Bloomberg calculates enterprise value a little differently. And again, you go back to the 80s. When these formulas were developed in the 80s, companies didn't have a lot of non-operating assets. The big non-operating asset was cash. Take all of your enterprise value, subtract the cash. What do you actually get? in theory, in our model. Three and four minus two. What are you left with? You're left with the operating value. What Bloomberg calls enterprise value, what the rest of the world calls enterprise value, is closer to an operating value, right? Because basically, it's net of cash as the biggest operating non-operating asset. So it's all of the value of the debt and equity minus all of the cash, right? So again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. That's what the, the real world actually uses. But our model is doing it slightly different because we have an academic model. So in order to compare the multiples that the model creates with the real world multiples, I have to adjust. So on your next homework assignment, here's how you adjust. You come into the multiples and you go to the DCF. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this the Bloomberg equivalent value Actually, sorry, put it down here. BEV for Bloomberg Equivalent uh, Enterprise Value. So, how would Bloomberg calculate enterprise value in our model? Well, it's the market value of the equity. We already have that. We have the common value of the equity. Plus, off the TFI, they would add in the debt. They would add in the preferred stock. And they would add in the minority interest, and then they would subtract all of the cash, not just the excess cash. So I'd actually have to go back to the balance sheet and subtract the operating cash, and I'd have to subtract the excess cash for 2014. So that Bloomberg would actually use an enterprise value closer to 118 billion. That would be what I would call the Bloomberg equivalent enterprise value, which basically follows this formula. Okay, so here's the point. In our multiples, EV to sales equals the Bloomberg enterprise value divided by, from the assumptions, 2016 forward sales. EV to EBITDA equals the Bloomberg equivalent enterprise value in our model divided by assumptions, 2016 EBITDA. EV to EBIT equals, from the DCF, Bloomberg equivalent enterprise value divided by, from the income tab, 2016, which is the second forward year, operating income, which is the EBIT. So I-10. Price to earnings equals <clears throat> price is the equity value divided by earnings, net income, two forward years, 2016 net income, available to common shareholders, I-25. Okay, so I quickly have a, actually, sorry, I don't want to use I-25, I want to use I- Use the actual net income. So I 2016 be net income. I 22. Okay. And finally, price to book equals equity value divided by book values, the current book value, so balance sheet 2014 total equity. So there's the point. I have the multiples in my model that this share price is inferring, hence the word implied.
here's how we do a sanity check. This is not only the, the actual trading comps for McDonald's, it's McDonald's and all their peers. So let's say that I am a bull on McDonald's. I think they're going to do really well. So I think they're going to return to growth. I put 4% followed by 6% and then 4%. And I think internationally they're going to crank up their CVG to 4% because there's a lot more people eating fast casual worldwide. I actually think their margins are going to stay strong. And I forecast $193 stock price. All right. Here's my sanity check. Sanity check number one, that's the ROIC chart, which unfortunately doesn't immediately tell me there's a red flag with what I've done. But then I go to sanity check number two and I look at my implied comps, my implied multiples. So let's go to the multiple tab that we just added. In order to have that stock price, they would have to trade at an EV to sales of almost eight. In order to have that stock price, they would have to trade in an EV to EBITDA of 21, a PE of 37, and a price to book of 14, and an EV to EBIT of 25. Look at the entire industry. Is that a reasonable stock price? Not just for McDonald's, for anybody in the fast casual industry. Is that a reasonable multiple? So going to pay eight times EV to sales? Well, nobody's coming close to eight times EV to sales. So that's the point. I can't justify that McDonald's is going to see their share price go up to 180, 190 a share. It just doesn't make any sense. Nobody's going to pay for that, right? And there's just data in the market because these are professionals that are covering these companies. They have a sense of not just the company, but what the industry is going to do. So this is your second sanity check. This is what's called the implied multiples. After you do your valuation, you have to show me what the implied multiples are. The nice thing about the as is, is if you have a hold and you believe that the as is and the hold are your final stock price, then the applied multiples are going to be very reasonable because they should be right pretty much close to the actual multiples of the company, right? It's really when you get away from the current share price that the implied multiples make sense. So this will be your next graded assignment. It'll be available during class on Wednesday. I'll call it a Bloomberg lab because you'll need to use Bloomberg in order to get all of this data. And then you'll do it in a different company besides McDonald's. It'll be due next Monday, 10 a.m. for all sections. And then again, next Monday and Wednesday is the bat week. Okay, So there will be no class during the bat week. I'll give you most of the time during the bat to work on your group projects. So at this point, we finished everything that you need to get started on those group projects that we've talked about. You're three weeks away. And one of the weeks is Thanksgiving. So I would start to use this time, particularly next week, to start assembling as a team and using some of the class time in addition to the bat to help you guys with the group projects. Okay. All right. So next uh, lecture will be on Monday the 16th. Uh, and then we'll talk about all the stuff that we missed and then do yet another company example. Okay. See everybody in about a week and a half.